The 1920s were a time of phenomenal growth and change in America. Businesses were doing very well and relatively recent inventions like cars and radios were changing people's lives. In addition, the stock market was going up and up. But while some people were getting much richer, most Americans weren't seeing their lives improve as much. The very wealthy saw their extra money increase a lot, but regular families didn't gain nearly as much. People were also buying stocks for prices that were too high compared to what the companies were actually worth. So even though things looked good on the surface, there were some big problems underneath that would soon cause trouble for the country's economy. Trouble that would soon completely change the landscape of America. In October 1929, everything fell apart. The stock market, which had been doing so well, suddenly crashed. <laughs> On the worst day, called Black Tuesday, the stock market lost a lot of its value. Over the ensuing years, people who had invested their money in the stock market lost almost all of it. Banks started to close because everyone wanted their money back at the same time, and the banks had also made some bad investments. By 1933, the country was in a really bad situation. Many businesses closed, and a lot of people lost their jobs. In fact, roughly one out of every four workers were unemployed. People were having a hard time buying food and keeping their homes. This tough time was called the Great Depression. Many people had to stand in long lines to get free food. Some even had to live in poor neighborhoods called Hoovervilles, named after the president at the time, Herbert Hoover. In addition, a lack of rainfall and big dust storms in the middle of the country destroyed many farm crops. Approximately 2.5 million people had to leave their homes and farms in what were known as the Dust Bowl states. Those impacted had to look for work in other places like California. As John Steinbeck so poignantly captured in his masterpiece, The Grapes of Wrath, and the dispossessed, the migrants flowed into California. This human tide, swelled by the broken dreams of a generation, became a defining image of the era's despair, and this sadness took monumental change to overcome. Initially, President Herbert Hoover's response to the crisis was restrained, reflecting his deep-seated belief in the virtues of limited government intervention and self-reliance. But as the depths of the depression became increasingly apparent, the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932 marked a decisive turning point. That the deep question in this campaign is one of confidence in leadership. Roosevelt's audacious New Deal program unleashed a torrent of bold experiments designed to restart the sputtering economy and weave a vital social safety net. He started programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration to help people who lost their jobs. These programs gave millions of people work, building and fixing things like roads, bridges and parks across the country. Roosevelt also made changes to the banking system. He created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which made sure people didn't lose their money if their bank closed. This helped people trust banks again. Another important change was the Social Security Act. This law created a special program to help older people, people with disabilities, and others who needed extra support. There were also new laws called the National Industrial Recovery Act and the Agricultural Adjustment Act. These laws tried to make things better for businesses and farmers. They worked to keep prices stable, make working conditions better, and make the economy fairer for everyone. All of these programs and changes were part of Roosevelt's big plan to help the country get back on its feet during the Great Depression. As Roosevelt declared in his iconic 1933 inaugural address, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. These words became a rallying cry for a nation mired in despair a beacon of hope in the face of unrelenting adversity. 
But not just America, but the whole world was soon to change in a few years with what was to come. While the New Deal provided desperately needed relief and laid the foundations for a more equitable society, it was ironically the onset of World War II that conclusively ended the Depression's grip on the nation. From 1939 to 1944, as America's industrial might roared to life in support of the Allied war effort, unemployment plummeted from a stifling 17.2% to a mere 1.2%. This was partly driven by women and minorities in the workforce. For example, one of the most iconic symbols of this era is Rosie the Riveter. This campaign encouraged women to take on roles traditionally held by men. Learning how and where to put the 700,000 rivets that go into a single Liberator bomber. Particularly in manufacturing and industrial jobs. Women stepped into factories, shipyards and other essential industries proving their capability and changing the workforce dynamics forever. The war accelerated technological and industrial innovation like never before. Some of the key technological uses included radar, jet engines which revolutionized aviation and early computing technologies. In 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference was held, establishing the US dollar as the world's primary reserve currency and creating institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The Bretton Woods system ensured that the US would play a central role in the post-war economic order, further solidifying its economic dominance. Whilst World War II was a horrific evil in world history, it did mark a seismic shift in the nation's economic trajectory, eventually ushering in an era of unprecedented prosperity and global leadership. The lessons of the Great Depression offer enduring insights into the perils of unchecked inequality and the vital role of government in tempering the excesses of unfettered capitalism. The crisis laid bare the stark realities of a nation divided, with the wealthiest 0.1% holding a share of wealth equal to that of the bottom 42% by 1933. It underscored the indispensable necessity of bold government action in the face of market failures and economic collapse. A lesson that would shape the course of American policy for generations to come. As we navigate the complex economic landscape of our own time, we must heed the enduring wisdom of those who bore witness to the Depression's darkest hours. The words of British economist John Maynard Keynes, writing in the depths of the crisis in 1936, ring out with particular resonance. The outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. By learning from the hard-won lessons of the past, we can strive to build an economy that truly works for all. One that provides opportunity, security and dignity for everyone. We must summon the courage to confront the deep-seated inequities that threaten to tear at our social fabric and to forge a path towards a more just and inclusive future. Did you know President Roosevelt reminded us in the midst of the Depression's darkest days that the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. What lessons from this pivotal period do you think are most relevant for our global economic challenges today? How can we apply the wisdom of the past to build a more equitable and resilient future? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this video valuable, please like and subscribe to the Financial Frenzy community for more thought-provoking analysis of the economic forces shaping our world. Together, we can navigate the complexities of our economy and strive for a better tomorrow. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.